You're now listening to episode 129 of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Brandon Hall and Thomas Costelli joined here with David Green, co-host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, author of Buy, Rehab, Rent, Refinance, Repeat, also known as the Burr Book, and Long Distance Real Estate Investing, How to Buy, Rehab, and Manage Out-of-State Rental Property. He is also an award-winning California real estate agent and multifaceted real estate investor. In today's episode, we discuss how to execute the Burr strategy from long distance for all the out-of-state real estate investors tuning in. We also discuss how Dave handled the ups and downs of 2020 and the COVID-19 crisis. Then we gaze into his crystal ball as he strategizes for 2021 and the years ahead. We also discuss what tax strategies he uses and more. Before we dive right into today's episode, we do want to let you know about the new Tax Smart Real Estate Investor community on Facebook. It's the one-stop shop for real estate investors to learn about tax strategies and stay up to date on changing tax laws. With nearly 400 members and counting, there are a ton of conversations taking place right now. Join today by visiting www.facebook.com slash group slash tax smart investors or by searching for tax smart real estate investors on Facebook to make sure you're not missing out on major opportunities for tax savings. The link will be in the show notes below. We look forward to seeing you there. But for right now, let's jump right into today's episode. Dave, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Would you be able to give our listeners a little information on your background? It's so smart you asked that question because what I usually get is the host saying, hey, how how can I introduce you? And they never remember it because I do way too many different things. So I'm a former police officer. Now I'm a real estate broker and loan broker. So I help people buying and sell houses and doing refinances and getting loans uh, through the teams that I run. I'm a real estate investor. I've got properties in five different states. And then I have shares in apartment complexes and I also flip houses. I wrote a book called Long Distance Real Estate Investing that details the systems that I use to buy houses in different areas, as well as a book called Buy, Rehab, Rent, Refinance, Repeat, which spells out the Burr strategy that I use to scale. I host the Bigger Pockets podcast with Brandon Turner, where we teach people how to invest in real estate. And I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. But uh, that's pretty much the gist of it. I'm an all-around real estate nerd. We love to hear that. So kind of kicking off, kind of kicking off here with the Burr method. We know it's very popular amongst the real estate community. You literally wrote the book on it. Would you be able to kind of take us into what Burr is and like what does like a perfectly executed Burr strategy look like pre-COVID? Absolutely. So in order to understand the Burr method, the first thing you have to understand is the traditional method, because this is just a different way of doing the same thing that people have been doing for a long time. It's not like a new type of investment. It's not like Bitcoin or something like that. When you normally buy a house, you put a down payment when you buy it. So you're financing at the same time that you're buying it. Then you spend some money to fix it up. Because if you're an investor, you probably bought a house and need some work. That's why you got a better deal. You're left with equity in the property itself. So you've added wealth for yourself. And then you rent it out to somebody and it cash flows. And over time, it grows in value and the rents go up. And so does the cash flow. The problem is all of your down payment and all the money that you sunk into the rehab cost stays in the property. So if you buy a house and you put all your money into it, and let's say that you bought it for $90,000 and you're $30,000 all in and it's worth one hundred and twenty. dollars You've made $30,000, but you left $30,000 in it. So it's got a total of like, say, $60,000 in equity that you can't use for anything. And the problem with real estate is that you make your money when you buy. You buy good deals and you manage them wisely and your wealth will grow. Well, when all of your capital is getting sunk into deals, you can't scale very quick. So the Burr method is just a rearranging of the order of when you finance. So when you're instead of buying traditionally where you put a down payment, then you fix it up. With the Burr method, you tend to either pay cash or use a hard money loan or private money, something where you're not just sinking a down payment into a property that stays there. Then you put money into fixing it up and you make it worth more. At the time it's worth more, you then refinance it. And if the 75% of that money that you can pull out of the after repair value is the same or close to the money that you put in, 
you get all your capital back, you can reinvest it. It's just a way of not leaving the equity in the deal. It's getting the equity back out of the deal so it can be used to reinvest in the next project. And the best example I could give is if you went and you bought a really nasty fixer upper, you spent $60,000, then you spent $30,000 to fix it up and make it worth more. So you've spent $90,000. That's your investment basis. If it's worth $120,000 when you're done, you've added $30,000 in equity. Good job. You've created some wealth for yourself. The bank's going to say you can borrow approximately 75% of that $120,000. So you get to get a check written to you, or it's probably more like funds wired to your account for $90,000, which is the same money that you either borrowed or saved to buy the house. So you get your investment back out. You go buy your next house for sixty thousand. Put thirty thousand into it, and that is probably like the most simple explanation of why this strategy works. I hear a lot of complaints about how it's risky. I just I can't see from any angle how this is more risky than it is to do anything else. People say it's over leveraging, but if you're leaving thirty thousand dollars of equity, you're still leaving twenty five percent of the money in the deal. That's not any more risky than if you put 25% down when you first bought it. I think it's just really a misunderstanding of what's happening. So, so they say it's risky because, because of the over-leveraging aspect or, or are there it, other reasons? Over-leveraging is the number one thing that I hear people say Burr is risky because of this reason. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So, so Burr is buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. That's what the Burr stands for. Is there any sort of seasoning period in between the acquisition and the refinance. I know that a lot of conventional lenders will tell you six months, but we also seem to have clients that have a lot of success in turning it around pretty quickly. So what's what's your experience related to uh, the seasoning or working on that refinance? There's no law that says you have to wait a period of time, but different lenders do have different guidelines. And typically, if you want to go get the best loan you can possibly get, which is going to be a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac insured loan, they do have requirements that are called overlays. And one of them is usually you have to wait six months after purchasing before you can refinance. Now, that's what people are running into when you hear that six-month number. And if you didn't want to wait six months, what have you found to be a successful strategy to get that financing faster? You look for a different lender, but you have to adjust your expectations that you're not going to get the very best loan that you see everyone else getting. And that's where people get hung up is they're like, I want 30 year fixed rate, super great interest rate, everything perfect for me. And I don't want to have to wait six months. You have to let that go. It's sort of an either or. So when I do it, I don't go get Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. I can't get them. I have too many properties. So you can either go to a portfolio lender who's going to hold that note on their own portfolio and they're not selling it to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, so they don't have to worry about those rules. Or you can get commercial financing if you find a lender that will let you take maybe a couple of these properties together, take out a commercial loan on them. I do that all the time and there's zero seasoning period. As soon as the appraisal comes back, they take 75% of whatever that number is and they'll fund my loan. Nice, nice. So transitioning just a little bit to uh, some of the other stuff you've done. And I think this is actually going to tie in quite nicely. So you're also the author of the book, uh, Long Distance Real Estate Investing. And I know for a lot of people who live in maybe California or New York, like myself, that's sometimes the only option because the properties in your backyard are, are too expensive. So what's your advice for someone who, who wants to execute the Burr strategy from a distance? That's the way that I do it. So it's not any different when you're investing somewhere else than when you're investing in your same market. The wonderful thing is that math stays the same no matter where you go. So the key to a successful burr is you buy something under market value. This doesn't work if you're paying market value for the price. You might as well just do the traditional method because if you're not adding equity to it or buying in with equity in it, you don't have that delta that you need to refinancing and get your money back out. The other thing is managing the rehab. You're probably going to be buying a property that needs some work. So you need a contractor that you can trust that does good work that can get it done. So when you're buying out of state, the first thing to make sure you get right with the Burr is that you're not paying market value. Don't think you're going to do this and get a turnkey property. There's a handful of times where I've gotten such a great deal and the house did not need work that I used the Burr method. It's very rare. So don't plan on that. Plan on it's going to be a fixer-upper and you're going to need a contractor. And if you get those two things right, you buy it below market value. And so your appraisal comes in where you need it to, which is more than what you paid. And the construction process goes smooth. You can burr anywhere the same as you can buy properties any other way. 
Nice. Nice. And when it comes time to after the burr, so after you, you burr it and uh, you get to the next point, what are your tips for managing a portfolio of properties from a distance? Yeah. So I've got a, a, I'm a systems guy. I don't like, once I've taken down the property, I, it's like I planted a tree. I don't like having to go back and prune the leaves and collect the fruit. I like other people to do all that. So what I have mine set up where I have two property managers in every state where I own rental property. And that's there as a fail safe in case one of them goes down, goes out of business. I don't like the way that they handled my stuff. They got rid of the employee I like, they hired a new one, whatever. I can quickly shift them over to the other one while I look for a replacement. That's the first piece of advice that I would give. The next is that even when you have property managers, they are still going to have to come to you with questions about how you would like something resolved. The value that they bring in those situations is that they're bringing you a summary of what went wrong. When you manage it yourself, you're going to have to listen to the tenant. You're going to have to make all the phone calls. You're going to have to get bids. You're going to have to work on solving the problem yourself. So I like property managers because they've done this before and they save me time. So let's say I've got five different states where I own property. That's 10 different property managers that I'm dealing with. What I did was I set up one email that they all send their requests to as well as their statements to. That one email, I have a person that I hire that watches that one email. So I funneled everything into one place. They either bring it to my attention if I need to make a decision and I can make a very quick decision or they can handle it before it gets to me. They also take all the property management statements uploaded into our spreadsheets for tracking. Um, they can track all the expenses from that same email. It's really, really simple. And then I use that email also for new acquisitions. So when agents are going to send me a deal or... I'm looking at doing something with a partner. That's the email that I'm using so that that person who manages my portfolio sees what's coming in and out. And then they come let me know if there's something urgent that requires my attention. So investing at a distance, I'm sure that you've experienced some pain. What would you say is the number one or a couple key tips that out-of-state investors should be aware of or, or things that they should implement to reduce the issues that they're going to experience investing out-of-state? The first is that you have a subconscious bias that you're going to assume the way that state works is the way wherever you live works. And so contracts are written differently. I had one issue where in California, if you have a house under proper contract and you have an inspection contingency, you can back out even after the time period you have specified for that contingency if you haven't waived the actual contingency. So you have a 12-day period of time on day 13, you can still back out of the deal and get your deposit back. The seller just has the right to kick you out of the deal once you go past 12 days, but you'd get your money back. So I assume that was how it worked in every other state. And Florida is different. On day 13, in that scenario, you can't back out of the deal and get your money back. Your deposit is jeopardized. You either close or you lose it. So I would have times where I would get busy and I wouldn't stay on top of everything. Or I, in this case, I just literally forgot that I had a property under contract because I had so many I was moving on. And I didn't think it was a big deal because I knew I had inspection contingencies. So in the back of my head, I'm safe. I can just back out of the deal. turns out I didn't. So I lost $5,000 on a house I decided that I didn't want to buy. That's one area that it's very easy to make a mistake that you don't even know you need to be careful because subconsciously you're thinking this is the way it works. I've got a very similar experience. I live in North Carolina and I've bought property in North Carolina and we were under contract for a couple of properties in South Carolina. Uh, same sort of situation. We, we thought that South Carolina would work exactly the same as North Carolina. But if you read the fine print, you realize, oh, this is completely different. And it's important to make sure that if you are going to cross state lines, that you're very well aware of, of how they structure contracts. So really good advice there. How has 2020 been for you guys? I know that there's been some ups and downs across the country. And I know that you're involved in a lot of different areas of real estate. What are you seeing and or, or how has 2020 affected real estate in your eyes? Man, that's a good, great question. And there's a lot we can unpack with it. I'd say the first thing is I'm in California. So our shelter in place was very uh, significant. It was like everything was shut down. So when that happened... I made a conscious decision. I gathered the team together and I said, listen, we're not going to go hide and wait for this thing to pass. We don't know how it's going to play out. We don't know if it's going to be whatever it was like 18 days to slow the spread or if it's going to be more. We're going to get on the horn. And I had eight, 28 properties in contract for different clients at that time with my real estate team. We're going to get on the phone and we're going to tell every single person, this is what's going on. Tell me what your goals are. Let's decide right now if it's a good idea for you to close on this property or not. 
instead of shrinking back and letting problems come to me, I was very proactive. I then started checking in with all the lenders. And that was really the chaos in the beginning was that all the rules for like making loans change. So we have all these properties in contract and now we don't know if they're going to fund or not. There was talk of all of the, the lending liquidity completely drying up. So we had to take on that challenge and we had to contact all the listing agents that we had and say, hey, this may go a lot longer. We still want to buy your house. Let's come up with an extension rather than waiting for the period of time it was supposed to close and then dealing with it. Same with all my clients, my sellers. I told them right away, you're never closing in 20 days like what we said. It could be longer. Let's come up with a plan to make sure that works for you. Then my own portfolio, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was pretty sure that the government wasn't going to be letting us evict people in the middle of all the chaos. And that's exactly what ended up happening. So I made sure I had enough money in reserves. I'm always very, cons- I'm aggressive when I'm buying and building, but I'm very conservative with the reserves that I'm holding in the way that I underwrite. So I really didn't care at all if tenants stopped paying or if they didn't stop paying. I just told myself like 30 years from now, whatever happened in this time frame, I'm not going to care. The houses are going to go up three, four times in value. The rents are going to keep going up. There's nothing that was ever written in stone that said David should never have a bad year. This is part of building wealth is that you ride ups and downs. Undulations literally create wealth opportunities. You can't take advantage of them when it works for you and then complain about them when it doesn't work for you. So you have to have some flexibility understanding this is a part of why there is the ability to create wealth because markets go up and down. If they didn't, it would be very, very hard to kind of like ride those cycles and and build your wealth. So 2020 for me ended up being the best year that I've ever had. We almost quadrupled our sales on my real estate team from last year, which I was already the top agent in my office. So that was awesome. I started a, a mortgage company and we were doing really good with loans. I've grown my staff by about three to four times what it was before this thing happened. And we've just had to be flexible. Sometimes we work out of my house. Sometimes we work out of the office. Sometimes we work out of a different office. We're moving around all the time, but it's forced us to like, maybe say, tighten up our systems. It's forced us to be better about communication. Everybody on my team has become a better problem solver. It's it's always tempting when everything's going good to assume you just do the same thing every single day, just become kind of a drone. Now everybody's waiting for the next change that's going to happen. And I think it makes us better able to serve our clients and uh, build our own portfolios better. How do you start a mortgage company? <laughs> I heard you slip that one in. I'm curious. Yeah. So I had to become a real estate broker. So I, I passed my test to become a broker. And then um, at that point, you're eligible to do both loans and real estate once you get your uh, NMLS license in California. So what I did was I went and found a person who's really good at doing loans and done it for a really long time that knows the business super good, but never really scaled as far as how many clients they could work with. I partnered with that person because I want their experience and their customer service and like their standard for how they do work. I was very impressed with this person. Then I went and hired people that wanted to be in the, the loan officer business, but had no one to teach them, needed a mentor, had no way to get loans themselves and weren't licensed. I surrounded this superstar with four people that were smart, hardworking and studying to get their license and let them do all the work that non-licensed people can do. So they did all the grunt work. They're collecting all the documents from the clients for that person. They're reviewing the conditions that come back on the loans and they're saying, hey, here's where we are. He gives the marching orders and then they go out there and they actually execute it. And I made that one person now able to do 10 times as many loans as they could before because they had four people. And that's really the beginning of the company. So I'm looking to continue adding new people into that world, both inexperienced, hardworking, junior people that are going to get licensed and be good and experienced people who want that support and can scale. And I don't, I I know it was in the middle of a bunch of craziness, but really it's like investing is numbers based. There's fundamentals to understanding it. And the same comes to small business. All right. So 2020 is almost right behind us. We are in December at this point. It sounds like you had a very good year, despite all the ups and downs that 2020 brought. Um, and we, you know, we, we try to avoid having people whip out their crystal ball, but I think uh, if you don't mind dusting yours off, I just kind of wanted to see what you, what do you see coming down the pipeline for 2021 in the single family space? Okay. I like these questions. Most people hate them. Most people that you talk to, they, you'll never hear like a Robert Kiyosaki ever answer one of those questions directly. And this is not a dig against anybody in particular, but 
just for the listeners, everyone hates answering these questions because if you say it wrong, you lose credibility. And if you say it right, nobody even remembers what you said. But at the same time, I can't stand when I don't get a direct answer to a direct question. So I'm going to give you my honest answer, what I'm planning on with my own thing. I'll give you my logic to support it, but I want to be clear. Don't go make a decision just saying David said it, so I should go do it. Don't think this represents the opinions of bigger pockets or you guys in your company. There's no way I can know. I'm just going to tell you how I'm reading the tea leaves. Okay. I think when we see the new president that was elected, it's safe to assume taxes are not going down. Taxes will be going up. So if you're making high income, it's not enough to just make high income. You're going to start getting hammered on that. And you should start immediately looking at how you're going to leverage part of your business so that other people who are in lower income tax brackets are making more of your money, but you're getting your time back. Because I think actually creating wealth through offensive means, which is like earning income, is going to become very difficult. Just look at it like it's a rule change in the NFL where the quarterbacks and the wide receivers don't have as much freedom as they used to. It's very easy to sack the quarterback, the defensive ends or the, the cornerbacks are allowed to put their hands on the receivers. The points are going down. That doesn't mean football is going to suck, but the way that you play the game should change. That's the first thing I would say. There's also what people refer to as tax loopholes, which I, I've always hated that phrase because it sounds very disingenuous and, and, and shady. What they really are are rewards or incentives from the government to encourage a certain way, a certain behavior that typically is advantageous to the country as a whole. So business owner get loopholes because they create jobs for people. So there's less people on like welfare. A lot of those strategies that we've used to keep our, our taxes lower, but maybe our risk went higher, could start going away. I don't know. And I'm, I'm frankly not a big political guy. So I don't actually have a great understanding of the Senate and the House versus the president and how much power they have. So I'm not making a direct prediction. But if it works out in a situation where the president can make changes that they want to make, I would expect to see some of the ways that real estate investors sheltering income going away. And I think we've kind of been asking for this, to be frank, with how much bragging people like President Trump did or the Grant Cardones and the Robert Kiyosaki's where they're like, I haven't paid taxes in 10 years. And you know, this person's a multi, multi, multi-millionaire. That irritates people. And I think they are going to change things like, if they can, uh, maybe the uh, the depreciation against income earned other than the, what the property produced for a full-time real estate professional, the 1031 like-kind exchange. Strategies that investors have used where they're compensated for risks that they're taking, I think is going to change in 2021 if the president is able to. So you have to be prepared for that. There's, It's going to be maybe harder to shelter income. So you should probably do things differently. I also think that the laws that protect tenants that are not in a landlord's favor, are we're going to see a trend where that continues to grow. Rent control is going to happen in more uh, cities. I think that like eviction moratoriums are going to become a thing again. It's going to be much harder to get a tenant out of a property if they're a problem. And so we should be thinking about how that's going to affect our business. Are you going to buy in different areas? Because those areas have tenants that are less likely to just say, I'm not going to pay. I think that in general, that's a thing that we just sort of, we knew could go wrong, but it never really did, where it's actually going to move to the forefront. Like this is now a thing that the other team is routinely doing. They are blitzing us like this all the time. How are we going to come up with a way to stop that? So what are you doing with your portfolio to kind of hedge against these risks? I'm not doing a ton because I, I'm waiting to see like what's going to happen before I freak out. I think way too many human beings hear something could go wrong and they immediately assume it will go wrong. They get in this anxiety induced emotional state and they make bad decisions. Okay. So I'm planning in my mind three or four different strategies that I could implement and putting the pieces together for them, but I'm not letting it affect my emotions right now. This is another thing I like to say every single four years when we have a presidential election, there's a huge percentage of the population that says, I'm going to wait to see what happens after the election before I do anything. I'm sure you guys hear this. Okay. Or if this person's elected president, I'm leaving the country. Like, but when I actually look at the impact it has on us, I'm not trying to diminish like the feelings people have if the nominee that they wanted didn't get elected. But President Obama to President Trump was about as severe of a swing from one political spectrum to the other as you could get. And overall, our lives did not have a huge change. 
So I remind myself of this all the time that no matter what happens, it's not going to have an insanely dramatic effect on me. So a few strategies that I'm looking at, because I hate when people don't answer the question directly. So I don't want to do that. The 1031 light kind exchange could be going away. If it looks like that's like Biden's actually said, he wants to get rid of that. If it looks like that's gaining traction, it's going to happen. I will probably 1031 some of my smaller properties into a bigger property that has less growth potential, but more cash flow right off the bat. I'm just going to boom, make the move. I'm not going to worry about getting the deal of the century. I'm not going to worry about having a huge value add. It's more, I want to move my equity over now before I can't move it at all. That's one thing I would change. Another thing would be the areas that I'm buying in. I think if it becomes really difficult to raise rents on tenants or get them out, then you kind of have to play the appreciation game more than the cash flow game because your ability to say run the ball with cash flow is being restricted by the rules of the game changing. Don't get mad about it. Don't get bitter about it. Just recognize that's what it is. The rules are changing. You build your team a little bit differently. So that location that you invest in will become much more important. I'm also preparing that if the 1031 goes away, that's not just going to affect the investor who sold and pays capital gains. This is something everyone should understand. Every time a transaction takes place where a property changes hands, there are a lot of people that are needed to make that happen. And a lot of people earn income. So in one case where someone sells a property and, and does a 1031 into a new property, that is four real estate agents typically that earn income on that. Two for each side that earn commissions. There's a loan officer on each of those that most likely earn money that was going to be taxed. There are people like you, CPAs, that are advising the person who's doing it that are probably going to earn some money. There's a home inspector. There's a home appraiser. There's a home warranty company. There's a title company. There are the handyman that come in and do the work. There's the person who does the survey, like wherever, wherever it is, there are a ton of people who earn their income from properties changing hands. If we disincentivize people to do that, those industries are going to be affected too. There's going to be less income tax that's actually generated. And there's going to be less income if you're in that industry. So you should be paying attention to that. And you may have to pivot if you're a person who does cost segregation studies and that goes away, you're not allowed to write off the depreciation of that income against uh, income in other areas. You might find yourself with like no money coming in. So I'm not panicking and saying, I'm going to go do all this. I'm just looking at it as objectively as I can saying, Hey, these are routes that could happen. These are things that could happen. What are different ways that I can earn money if that does happen? No, it's very well thought out. And uh, I'm going to have to start <laughs> start revisiting some of my, my my thought processes as well as a result of of everything that is happening. But so we, uh, what, what tax strategies are you currently using? You know, we do have to end up talking about taxes sometimes on this podcast. So yeah, I'm frantically trying to buy a place before the year ends. Don't know if I'm going to do it, but I'm putting like a, a last minute rush together to try to get something under contract. I really waited too long before I, I started planning for this because the year was so good and it was also so crazy. So in 2021, I'm much more prepared for what I'm going to do. But the biggest ways that I'm trying to save money myself would be cost segregation studies on larger apartment complexes to write off the depreciation against money that I made in other areas. Um, I started 401k plans for a lot of my employees. That was another area that I was able to get some write-offs and I was going to give them bonuses. And I just did it through that means like they got less of a cash bonus and more of a retirement bonus there. I restructured several of my companies into C corporations. So I can't really take the money out and use it as easily, but the taxes are lower. And then I just take the funds that are in that company and I reinvest it back into the company. So my own personal life is much less flashy. I'm living a much more humble lifestyle, which I'm fine with. It's kind of my style to be more conservative. But I did save quite a bit of money switching to a C corporation. It just means I gave up the ability to go spend that money easily because it's going to be double taxed if I take it out. And I'm looking to buy a couple condos in Hawaii with money from those corporations that I can use to send clients or um, other people that are supporting the business on like a vacation on me and people in my sphere of influence that send me referrals when I want to do something nice for them. Or I have friends that I can just be like, hey, go use the condo and the, the company will be the one owning that. Nice, nice. There's some pretty extensive stuff over there. But you know, we also know that you also have a book coming out specifically for real estate agents. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, thank you for asking about that, Thomas. Basically, if anyone has ever bought a house or sold a house, they know that most real estate agents are not very good at their job. I can come out and say that because I am one, so I have that immunity. 
there's not a lot of mentorship for real estate agents. It's hard to be an investor, being an agent's even tougher. I've done both and I tell people all the time, if you can invest or if you can be an agent, investing in real estate is freaking simple compared to what it's like to be an agent. So I wrote a book through Bigger Pockets Publishing called Sold, Every Real Estate Agent's Guide to Building a Profitable Business. That would be an awesome gift for any realtor you have in your life or any person that you've worked with that wants to be better at their job. It's basically the mentor that I can't be for everybody. It highlights at a very granular level. Here's what you have to do to be successful. Here's how a contract works. Here's how the escrow process works. Here's what you say to clients. Here's how you find clients. When they say this, you literally say that. And this should be the first of a three-part series that's written for real estate agents particularly so that if they really want to get good at their craft and perfect it, they kind of have a guide for how to get there. Nice, nice. When is that coming out and where can where can they get it? It's releasing January 21st, but you can pre-order at biggerpockets.com slash new books, biggerpockets.com slash new books. You can go there and you can get it. And I would just say in the industry of being a real estate agent, this is not talked about very often. We all see the flashy side. We see the agents that are driving the BMW and they're wearing nice suits and they always have nice shoes. And they're putting out this image of confidence. Underneath that, there is a very strong undercurrent of insecurity and doubt and getting kicked in the teeth all day long. There's a lot of shame that goes into that industry that people don't see. You see... Like it's kind of like Instagram amplified. You only see the best of what everybody is doing. So, what I've found is most of that shame is based on this understanding that they should be doing better and they would be doing better if they knew what to do. So, a book like this, I, when I was writing it, what was motivating me was those people that are sitting in their office, putting on a front, and underneath it, they're panicking. I don't know what to say. What do I do when the person asks me this? I'm going to look so stupid. And they're not taking action. So if you have anyone in your life that you care about, they're probably going through that. It would mean a lot to them if they had a guide that would walk them through what to do. I'm sure you guys in your industry have seen the same thing. Not every CPA is the same. There's a vast difference in the quality of service you get from the person who files your tax returns and calls themselves a CPA and the person that actually comes up with strategies that work specifically for you to save money and calls themselves a CPA. There's definitely a difference there. A hundred percent tax planning and, and tax compliance, two different things. Um, but we definitely see on both sides. There's definitely is a vast difference. And, uh, you know, unfortunately there's not a book for CPAs like the one you have for real estate agents to show you the path necessarily. We have to figure it out for ourselves, but that's okay. That's okay. With all that said, um, with everything you have going on, if our listeners did want to learn more about you and what you do have going on, what would be the best way for them to do so? If you go to Bigger Pockets and make a profile, you can send me a message on there. They have an email system that I check. If you're lazy and you don't want to do that, you can message me on Instagram. I make an effort to try to go through those. And if you live near me and you want to work on my team or you're looking for a job or you want to buy or sell a house or whatever, you can get my email off my Instagram. Send me a message there. We check that every single day and we'll get a hold of you really quick. All right. Well, we want to thank you for coming on the show today. I know that uh, I learned a lot, especially with the crystal ball. Uh, so uh, we'll go ahead. We'll drop the links in the show notes below for everybody's listening. You guys know the drill. I want to thank uh, Dave again for coming on the show today. It was an excellent episode. Thank you for that. I appreciate you guys. Everybody listening, if you liked what you heard, keep listening to more podcasts. During a period of time like this where you don't know what's happening, fill yourself with as much knowledge as you possibly can. It will really help your confidence and your peace of mind so that you're not worried about what's going to happen in the future. You're ready for what's going to happen in the future. Absolutely. And before we wrap up, I have to second that notion. Uh, you should probably do that with books as well. I know I've probably read like 20, 30 books this year as a result of COVID and just having nothing to do <laughs> for certain periods. So, you know, you're, you're never going to go wrong by doing things like that. I didn't know That's you didn't have anything to do, Tom. You should have told me. I would have. <laughs> oh. oh, well, you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, I can't, can't work 24 hours. Reevaluate. Hour you, know, you, re you read about an hour a day and you'll be good. Or maybe less, you know, 45 minutes, an hour a day, something like that. Thanks, David, for coming on. We really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients and with the new tax laws in play, you really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes and with your accounting and CFO needs. To become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.